We're going to ask you to open up your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter number 1. It's uh, also good to have Jacob and Sydney uh, in town with us. We, Miss Krista and I were able, thankfully, to uh, get them here for a family huddle. And then the storm came. Uh, but we're going to try to uh, have uh, a get-together tonight. So, uh, Lord willing, if you'll do... If, if We plan on being over in the field, okay? We're going to try to start around 4.30 uh, this evening. And so hope that you'll come and be a part of that. There'll be food. And uh, the things that we had hoped to do on Friday night, Lord willing, we're going to gather and try to do again tonight. So please come and be a part of that. And Lord willing, the Spanish ministry is going to join us tonight as well. Uh, as far as I know, unless there's been a change of their plans, they're going to try to join us as well. But it is uh, good to see Jacob and Miss Sydney here. Uh, let's go now into God's Word. Verse number 1, the Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have, t have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this, taber this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance." For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Father, thank you again for your mercy. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your kindness, your grace, and your goodness. Thank you for those that are gathered here today. Thank you for giving us a place to gather. We again lift up those to you, Lord, that are hurting, those that are hurting from material loss, those that are hurting from physical pain, those that are hurting from mental and emotional anguish, and then, Lord, those that are hurting because of the loss of loved ones. We ask that you would be merciful and that you would work and speak to their hearts and dear God, that even these tragedies could be turned for your glory, that many would come to know you as their Savior. I ask today that you would forgive me of my sin, that you would make me the preacher, make me the, the pastor, 
make me the person that you've called me to be and help me now to say exactly what you want said. I ask you, Holy Father, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you would anoint me afresh and anew, and that you would keep me from saying things that I shouldn't say. And I ask that you would keep me from behaving in a manner that is displeasing. Lord, we need you now. We long and we desperately need to hear from you now. Thank you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. We have for several weeks been uh, working our way through the, the life, the experiences of the Apostle Peter. We've talked about his sifting and talked about the change that this was to make in his life. Uh, we are reminded that uh, he was told, Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren." Over the years, I've, I've asked the question to people, some who were doubting their salvation actually. I asked them the question, when did Peter get saved? And y'all may have heard me or I may have even asked this to this congregation. I forget, okay? But when did Peter get saved? When you look at the life of Peter... It's a very interesting one. When you look, some would say Peter got saved at the call, right there at the boat. When the fish came piling into the boat and the Lord said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And he left everything on the shore and he went and followed Jesus. Some would say that's when he got saved. Some would say that he got saved when he was walking on the water, he's walking on the water, coming out to Jesus. If it be you, Lord, compel me to come. And he's walking on the water and he begins to sink when he sees the winds about around him boisterous. And he says, what does he say? Lord, save me. Some would say he got saved while sinking in the water. And then others would say that he obviously got saved when he proclaimed that thou, when Jesus asked, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And he said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Y'all with me? And Jesus said, Simon, my Father revealed that to you. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. No one has told you that, and I've not told you that. My Father has revealed that to you, and now you are going to be called Peter. I know I paraphrase, but now you're going to be called Peter. Some people would say, well, that was it. That's when he got saved. And then you see, after, after all of these things, after all of these things, Jesus has a conversation with him and says, Peter, you need to be converted. It's interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus said, Satan hath desired to sift you, and when he's finished, I have prayed for your faith. And when thou art converted... So everybody may be looking at me right now and saying, Pastor, so tell us, when did Peter get saved? Well, I think you ought to be worried about when did you get saved. What's going on in our lives, right? See, we are encouraged by the apostle Peter to make sure that of our, of our, of our calling, to make sure of our election, we are uh, throughout the, the New Testament, we're encouraged to be sure you're in the faith. You're in the faith. It's important for you and I to know that we are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
It's important that we recognize that we are not involved in a religious experience. And and I'm not trying to get anybody here to doubt your salvation this morning. That is not my objective at all. I am here to try to encourage our, our experience, our relationship with Jesus Christ. But let me say it like this. We are supposed to be walking toward a divine nature. A divine nature. Let's look at what the scripture says, okay? Look at what it says. Verse number one. Are we ready? Everybody okay? These letters are written after, without a doubt, they are written after Peter's conversion. So we could say it like this. What the seashore didn't do with the fish, the sifting did do. Is that fair? What the the, the standing and, and saying thou art the Christ, what that did not do, the sifting did do. Uh, We could even say uh, walking on the water. What walking on the water did not do, the sifting did do. There was something about this sifting of Satan that was an accomplishment. Accomplishment in Peter's life. And he is writing these letters after, listen, are you with me? His conversion. Anybody ever seen a conversion van? You've never seen a conversion van? Some of you have. It looks like an an old van on the outside, but on the inside it's been converted into a different type of van. Are you with me? That helps you understand the first two words... In this second letter, Simon Peter. Simon Peter. Peter here in his first letter references himself as Peter. Go back with me. His first letter, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. His second letter, he says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. What are we learning? We are learning that the apostle Peter has gone through a conversion. He's converted. What does he, how does he see himself? Here's how he sees himself. He sees himself as Simon and he sees himself as Peter. He sees himself as a servant and he sees himself as an apostle. He's helping us to understand what is going on. Because what was he told to do by Jesus Christ? Luke chapter 22, 32. Look at that again. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, what are you supposed to do? Strengthen thy brethren. Jesus Christ was letting him know, you're going to be sifted, you're going to be converted, your faith is going to be strengthened, and when it is converted, and when your faith is strengthened, here's what you're supposed to do. Help your brethren. And I need it, Peter. Help me. We look at his name, how how he sees himself. He sees he still has some Simon in him, but he sees he is becoming Peter. I don't know if that helps you, but it sure helps me. Because every time I turn around that I think that I'm becoming someone, I'll find myself still dealing with the old someone. It drives me crazy. Amen. And Peter's saying something here to us. He's saying, after my conversion, I've come to this conclusion. I am Simon and I am Peter. Everybody okay? The claim. Look at what he says. I'm Simon, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To be on, uh, to be... Uh, uh, what he's saying here, he's acknowledging something 
that he was supposed to be learning right before his sifting. Let's go back. What took place right before his sifting? Jesus took a towel and washed the disciples' feet like a servant. Are you still here? Wash the disciples' feet like a servant, and that's Peter got upset and said, you're not going to wash my feet. Remember? And then Peter said, you're going to deny me. But in that teaching, when Jesus finished washing the disciples' feet, he told his disciples to do likewise. You're supposed to be following a foot washer. And if, you don't, if we don't grab a hold of that in our Christian life, we are not being converted. We are followers of a foot washer that are supposed to wash other people's feet. We are on the planet to serve. He is Simon Peter, the servant and apostle. It's like the apostolic power, but a servant spirit. When we look at this, To be of the original apostles came with power and a promise. When you look at Luke chapter number 9, verse 1, if we'll bring that on the screens, Luke 9, 1, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. That was his apostolic power. To be a follower, to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, He had the power to cure diseases. He had power over all devils. That's who Peter was with his power. If you consider Matthew chapter number 19, Matthew 19, Matthew 19 verse number 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, talking about the disciples, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first. When we consider what is packed in the fact that Peter saw himself as an apostle, Peter knew that he had all power over devils. He knew he had all power over diseases. And he knew that he had a promise that he was going to rule with the other disciples over the 12 tribes of Israel during the millennial reign. But he precedes it with the word servant. A servant. This isn't... To me, guys, this surely isn't sounding like the guy... Earlier, when we consider this, Peter knows he's an apostle, but he sees himself as a servant. Why? Because Jesus said, are you with me? He said, when thou art converted, help your brethren. He didn't say when thou art converted, beat up your brethren, talk down to your brethren, go back and tell your brethren, I told you, I knew I was better than all of you all. I knew that when I met you the first time. No, he didn't do that. There's been a, there's been a conversion. There's a conversion. Amen. Amen. Look at verse number one. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. He is saying... He is writing this letter to saying to people, you have the exact same faith that I have. What? The apostle Peter is telling other people, your faith is just as good as mine? 
When you consider Matthew chapter 26, 33, maybe you'll understand the depths of this. Matthew 26, 33, Peter answered and said unto him, talking to Jesus, going back to that room experience where Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. Look at what he says in Matthew 26, 33. Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Wow. Oh my goodness. There was a time in Peter's life when talking to Jesus Christ, and when you, if you can imagine being one of the other disciples, and Jesus has just told all the disciples, tonight you're going to be offended in me, you're going to be offended by me, you're going to forsake me, all of you are going to. And the apostle Peter said, no, not all of us. He goes on to say, all men might be offended, but I won't. Not me. He was essentially even bringing an indictment against the rest of the disciples saying, I understand Jesus, why you don't trust any of them. I don't trust any of them either, but you need to know something. I will not be offended in you, Peter. No, you're not going to be offended in me. You're going to forsake me three times. Three times you're going to do it. Before the sun rises. Everybody okay? See, it could be argued that Peter thought that others may deny Christ, but he claimed he never would. Now look at what he says. This is, what, what is this? This is a conversion. He says to them that have obtained like precious faith. He is saying to you guys, the most precious faith. And he is legitimately saying to you guys, the most pre and to me, thankfully, the most precious thing that we have is our faith, and our faith is just as good and just as strong as his faith. He didn't have, he hadn't cornered the market on faith. Right. Now, what would have made him think that? Well... Jesus changed his name from Simon to Peter. He didn't do that for anybody else. He was the one that stood and said, uh, I have, I've had a revelation from your father, God, and I know that thou art the Christ. Yeah, and he was the guy who walked on water, right? And he did seem to be the leader of the group. Y'all with me? Yeah, there's a lot of things that could have caused the man to think. Well, I'm better, or at least my faith is. My faith is stronger. My, my faith is, or let's say it this way, my faith isn't as weak as everybody else's. But you know what happened? Satan sifted. And now he's converted. And when he looks around, whew, if Peter looked around this room this morning, being the apostle Peter, He'd say, man, I see your faith and it's precious. Amen. Faith is precious, y'all. He would look around this room and see that everybody in here that has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ has exercised a most precious faith. Amen. He's been converted. Then I want us to notice if we could... Look at what it says, and if it's okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read and reread, okay? Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Here's how you have obtained it. You've done it through the righteousness of God. Grace and peace be multiplied to unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Here is the point. We are what we are because of what God has done through Jesus, not us. 
Nobody is any better than anybody else in here. And we all are what we are because of the power of God and the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. See, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, this has happened, what? Through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This has happened, what? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. I understand that there is a mindset, and I have been wrapped up in the mindset on different occasions, of that we have got to investigate ourselves so that we can grow stronger in God and stronger in Christ. We will not grow stronger in God and stronger in Christ by a continual investigation of ourselves. If we continually investigate ourselves, we will find who we are, how we really are, and we will end up depressed and discouraged. Because within me dwelleth no good thing. We will find the goodness of Jesus by investigating Jesus. We will discover the goodness of God by investigating God. And I know that that is a slap in the face of New Age. And people call it New Age Christianity. That's an oxymoron. They, They cannot intertwine. It's just New Age. New age is, is that you are aspiring, you are climbing, you are finding that you have this in you. You do not. Your hope is not in you. Your hope is in God in you. The Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Everybody okay? Through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ... I'm not, I'm not throwing stones at Peter, and I'm sorry that he had to go through what he went through. But my goodness, when the sifting was finished, he's like, I am what I am by the grace of God. Apostle Paul agrees with that. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things. Look, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things, if only I could finally accept, eventually, hopefully, I'm longing for, hopefully, to understand that what I am going through in this life is so that I will quit trusting myself and start trusting God. That's what we're all going through. And yet we seem to go through these things over and over and over again because we keep trying to become better people. We're wicked we fail further than we think that we fail. That's right. Amen. There is none good, no, not one. Right. What Jesus is trying to get us and help us, He is dealing with us so that we will put our faith in Him so that He can deliver us from our wickedness. Right. He is the Savior, the one. When he said, and everybody always says, says, says amen, whether it be a Pentecostal church or a Baptist church. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I, Jesus, am the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The trials that you and I go through are not trials of your character. There's trials of your faith so that you will trust Jesus to give you His divine character. And if we don't get that right, you know what? It's, 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 It's horrible. If we go through a trial of faith, and the trial of faith is finished, and the end result is we think we're pretty good people, (laughs) <laughs> that's pride. Everybody okay? Beloved, these words are from a man who has been sifted to where he has 
not confidence in himself, but all his faith is in the Lord. And God forgive us, maybe not us, God forgive me. I have so failed for so many years of thinking that I'm going through what I'm going through so that I can be less dependent upon Christ. We go through what we go through so that we will be more dependent upon Christ. Amen. You say, well, before it's all over with, preacher, I, there's an old song. And, and, and before it's all over with, it sounds like it's going to be like that song, that horrible song, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. That doesn't look real Christian strong. That doesn't make me look real pious. Everybody okay? You know what we're, 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 Jesus is getting us all to? It's to this reality. You cannot even walk without him holding your hand. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. May I say it in love. And those that are experiencing the changing, the converting to where God is bringing about a divine nature, you may be understanding what I'm talking about. And others may be self-righteous and don't know what I'm talking about. That's dangerous. Verse number four. We're almost done. Whereby, look at what he says. According, verse number three, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Do you, do you, are you headed, is, is the path that you are on, is what you're experiencing, are you accepting and receiving that you are being called to His glory and to His virtue? Mm. whereby are given unto us exceeding and great promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What's going on, friend? And I mean it. What, what's going on? What's going on in you? What's going on in me? Are we, I don't, I don't want to word it the wrong way. I don't want to word it the wrong way. So I'll just be quiet on that. We've received promises. The thing about a promise is it has to be believed. It has to be trusted. It has to be received. What's one of the promises that you've received? The promise of salvation. Right. Romans 10, 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saved from what? And some, I think, think saved from the penalty of sin. And I would say, amen. Saved from eternal damnation. And I would say, amen. But do we understand we have been saved from the power of sin dominating our lives? 
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 2 Peter chapter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, should come to this change of heart and mind about our state, and would turn to Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 1, I exhort, therefore, that, this, that, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodness, excuse me, godliness and honesty. For this is a good and acceptable, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. What is one of the promises that we have received? We have received the promise of salvation, that the Lord Jesus Christ would save us from our sins. Not to sin, but from sin. He hasn't saved us to sin, he saved us from sin. And so we ha- should be taking on a divine nature. Oh, me. The promise of salvation, the promise of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 15, this is the words of Jesus. If ye love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Jesus Christ promised that His Holy Spirit would come to the believer and would not only come to the believer, but would come and live in the believer. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. If you are in Christ, you were baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus claims in John chapter number 3, you're born again. How? By the Spirit of God. You say, I know all of this. I hope that you do. Because these are promises. These are promises that are supposed to be believed so that we can be partakers of the divine nature. The promise of security. Romans 8, 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Verse 35, Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things 
things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a promise. Why? So that we could be partakers of the divine nature. Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse number 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. We have a promise of security. The promise of this security is why? So that we can be partakers of the divine nature. The promise of sanctification. The promise of sanctification. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. The apostle Peter is continually telling us, listen, this is coming from a man who has been converted. When did Peter get saved? All I know is that he got converted. When did you get saved? Are you converted? Are you converted? These precious promises, this fact that the Holy Spirit of God is doing a work of sanctification. What's that mean? Separating us from the world unto Christ. Is that going on in your life? Is this happening? Peter is saying, I've given, or he, the Lord has given. This is something. He's like, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, he's like, here's what I've learned. I'm no better than anybody else. I'm no better than anybody else, but here's what I've also learned, friends. I've learned that the Lord has given us all precious faith. And the Lord has given us all precious promises. He's basically telling us this morning, I've learned something. We can all be converted. We can all be converted. And not all of us listen very carefully. Peter went through his sifting to strengthen the brethren. And he's written letters, maybe, quite possibly, so that we could be partakers of the divine nature without having to go through the sifting. The promise of sanctification, 1 John 1 8. The promise of sanctification, 1 John 1 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. These are, these are Baptist verses here. <laughs> 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and the Word is not in us. Do we understand that this gift of confession is for our sanctification and our sanctification is a gift? Why? So that we could be partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature. The, this gift of confessing our sins, we're so, to confess them so that we can be cleansed from them. They're so, it's not supposed to be, I sin. oh, let me confess real quick. Oh, I sin. well, let me confess it real quick. It's not really what's supposed to be going on in our lives. It's really supposed to be a confession, a deliverance, a sanctification, and a partaking of the divine nature. It's what's supposed to be going on. In 1 John 2, 1, my little children, he goes on to say, my little children, these things write I unto you. Right after verse 10, 
If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for us ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are listening to a man who has experienced a conversion. It's stripped him of self-righteousness. It's stripped him of self-confidence. And it's caused him to understand something. I have, I can put my, I can put my faith in Jesus and Jesus will not let me down. <laughs> the promise of the power of Scripture, 1 Peter this is Peter again. 1 Peter 1, 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The Word of God is one of these precious promises. The Word of God will literally, if you will digest the Word of God, it will change your appetite. We'll say that one more time. If you will digest the Word of God, it will change your appetite. Amen. Yes. The appetite of your flesh? No. The appetite of your soul? Yes. Your soul will be converted. There will be a conversion process that starts taking place. Your mind will be renewed. Amen. Yes. By what? By the reading of the Word of God. It is a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Lord has given us precious promises. The precious promise of salvation. The precious promise of sanctification. The precious, precious promise of security. And the precious promise of His scriptures. He has given us these precious promises. Why? So that we could be partakers of the divine nature. We can be converted. Hallelujah. The promise of the power of prayer, 1 Peter 3, 7. This is an interesting thought, I think. 1 Peter 3, 7. Here's what Peter says. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, talking about their wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life. What? That your prayers be not hindered. The Apostle Paul is letting the husbands know, your prayers are so important, it should modify your behavior with your wife. The prayers that we pray are so precious and so important. We don't want them hindered. And this desire to not have my prayers hindered compels me to live with my, life, my, my wife and to treat my wife differently and to treat her better. James 5.16 says this, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The promises. Sanctification. Promise of security. Promise of salvation. Promise of the Holy Spirit. Promise of the Scriptures. And promise of that secret place of prayer has all been given to us so that we may be partakers of the divine nature. And these are coming from the heart and mind influenced by the Holy Spirit of a man who's been converted. 
And here's what he says. Add, go down with me, verse number 5. Verse number 4, it's talking about, I'm sorry I jumped too fast, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He is saying, I'm still Simon, but thank God I'm also Peter. And here is the escape. You escape through these pres- by these precious promises. And then he goes on to say, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and then to virtue knowledge. Have you or I added to our faith virtue? That's the next step, for lack of better words. Add to your faith. Are we living virtuous? When someone was to examine and explain or give a description of you, would they use the word virtuous? A virtuous woman, Proverbs 31, right? Well, what about a virtuous man? Would we... Let's stand. Lord... Thank you for your wonderful word. It's convicting power. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, his willingness to minister your word. And thank you, Lord, for the examples that you've set for us. And then, Lord, thank you. I thank you personally for the work that you are doing in our lives. Lord, I pray for myself first, Lord. I pray that virtue would be added. Help me to understand how Please. I pray, Lord, that we could escape and would escape the corruption that's in this world that we get caught up in because of the lust and desires of our flesh. I pray, Lord, that I would no longer seek to satisfy my flesh. I pray this for me. I pray this for my family. I pray this for this congregation that we would indeed recognize and accept and believe that we can be partakers of your divine nature in this life, Lord in this life. Thank you for what you're going to do. In the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen.